Hello everyone, uh, good afternoon and welcome to Easter Hag. And today I'm delighted to share with you uh, my project that I've built called Radar, uh, which uh, was created to uh, um, deal with the um, limitations and um, inefficiencies with existing tools when it comes to testing web authentication. Radar has changed the way I approach HTTP testing and today I'm going to show you how. Here's the agenda for today's talk. I will start with an introduction to talk about the origins of Radar and the problem it was created to solve. Then I will go into the methodology, explaining the basic core concepts uh, in Radar and uh, its architecture, how it works, and what makes it different from other tools. Then I will show, showcase you some uh, live demos, which will hopefully convince you to give it a try as well. And I'll learn the presentation with short conclusions and the Q&A session. Uh, now, let me introduce myself before I begin. I'm Daniel. I've been um, a penetration tester for uh, more than five years. Uh, for the last uh, year, a little bit longer, I've been working at Acodis, previously known as Modis. And uh, I have five more years experience working in IT, mostly as a sysadmin. I started building Radar about um, two years ago, and later the same year, it became a part of OVASP. And I'm still working on this project until now. So what is Radar? Uh, when I was uh, brainstorming with a friend um, the title for this presentation, I came up with this. OVASP Radar, a novel framework for manipulating HTTP, pr HTTP processes of persisting sessions. This sounds complicated. We are bad at naming things, and I hope by the next time I will have a much, uh, much shorter title to actually describe it. But for now, bear with me. So, uh, Radar was basically incepted with a goal to help make web authentication testing easier. But it has come a long way, it has evolved by now, and can be used for all kinds of HTTP processes of arbitrary complexity. How does it work? Basically, it defines a new DSL, which is a domain-specific language, in contrast with GPL, general programming languages like Path and Java and so on. And it uses this DSL to describe the client-server information exchange. It's also built with modularity in mind. So, uh, since it's impossible to build a tool that will cover all your future needs, uh, Radar takes that into account and the users can write their own code uh, to extend Radar. So the core, the main uh, core is written in Python, while the configuration files are written in a little known language called Highlang, uh, or Hi, which is a, a Lisp dialect on top of Python. And I will describe my uh, uh, design decisions in a later slide. Now let's talk about the problem. When I was testing the authentication with the barb suit, uh, I ended up with something like you can see in the screenshot. Basically, I had a, a bunch of poorly organized repeater tabs. So uh, my process was as follows. I had to go to the first step of the process, uh, do some modifications to the request, send the request, uh, go look into the response body, find some piece of information, copy it, go to the barb suit's decoder, encoder, modify it as necessary, then come back to the repeater, paste it into the right spot for the next step of the process, and so on. And I had to repeat this for every single step of the process, which can become frustrating. And it's also error-prone, if you copy one character less, for example. I needed a, a much more flexible solution, with fewer clicks. Once you understand how the authentication works, you usually want to automate it, or at least parts of it. With BarpSuit, this can be done with so-called BarpSuit macros. And uh, they work uh, for simple cases, when uh, you want to extract some um, information from a previous request and put it into the next one, uh, but um, uh, you can only extract based by some static strings or regular expressions. This will fall short if you need something more complex. Let's say you need to send the one-time password, the generated one-time password uh, from a secret, or you want to run some other arbitrary actions. 
In this case, barb suit uh, macros will not help you that much. You might need, you might uh, be able to achieve this using uh, by writing your own custom barb suit extensions, but this is also again not a very flexible solution. Now let's look at how Zap proxy automates authentication. Here you can see uh, you need to configure the so-called context in order to enable uh, authentication, and uh, you choose from some uh, predefined authentication types. Then you need to set up uh, the pattern to detect when the request is logged in and when it's logged out. Also, you may need to configure the actual users and uh, the session management parameters. And uh, while this looks trivial, in practice, it's not that trivial to set up. It's also very hard to debug when it's not working properly. And the most important of it all, this will only help you if you want to automate the authentication part in Zaproxy. It will not help you if you want to test the authentication process itself. It's worth mentioning Zaproxy also provides us with some so-called authentication scripts which, in theory, could be used to automate all kinds of authentication. However, they can run only inside this, those contexts, which I've shown in the previous slide. You cannot run those scripts standalone. So that's a, that was a deal breaker for me, because uh, I was particularly interested in the authentication, in testing authentication itself. Uh, Zap proxy also comes with uh, so-called Zest scripts which is an interesting feature. It's the closest to what I actually wanted to have uh, when I was building Radar. However, it has some pretty big limitations, and I believe it's because of its configuration file being written in static JSON. The earlier Radar prototypes were also using JSON configuration, uh, but uh, very soon I found out that it does not allow me to have the flexibility that I wanted. The writer. And I'm going to explain those JSON issues in a later slide. Uh, the challenges with authentication are well known in the Zap Proxy community. Here you can see a screenshot from the web page, which advises you to disable or simplify the authentication when testing to make your life easier. However, this is a disappointment, especially uh, if you are particularly interested in testing the authentication process itself, like I was. In this case, the tools such as Zaproxy and Barbsuit will not help you that much. So, now let's talk about JSON. As I said, uh, the uh, earlier Raider prototypes were also using JSON for its configuration. Turns out, JSON files get large and complicated fast. Uh, editing them manually is painful, and uh, it quickly becomes awkward when you have a lot of uh, requests and responses. You also need some special syntax to uh, reference previously defined items. You also need another syntax to um, process items, to encode, decode, do some string manipulations, and so on. And also, you cannot really um, easily reuse parts of the JSON that you've defined before. And all of those issues could be easily solved if we had real code instead of static JSON configuration file. Which brings us to the interesting part. Why Lisp? To most people, Lisp is an ancient language which does not have much real-world usage today. However, Lisp languages are ideal for creating your own custom DSLs, to many specific languages. Uh, and uh, one of the main uh, uh, reasons why it's so useful for my particular task for Raider is because of the concept so, so called homo iconicity, which is also called code is data and data is code. A programming language is homo iconic when the internal representation of the program can be manipulated as data using the language itself. So uh, the program is treated like a regular data structures. Uh, and this uh, gives the uh, users um, the power of metaprogramming. So basically, you write Lisp macros, which look like regular functions, but they're not. They not, do not return a value. They return pieces of code, which is why it's metaprogramming. You write code that generates or manipulates other code. And 
This is very useful to abstract away boilerplate code, to automate some tasks. And uh, that's really important for configuration files because you don't want to repeat yourself. You want to make it uh, reusable and to make it uh, easily, more easily maintainable, the code. And before I move to the next slide, I wanted to tell you my story with Lisp. I began using Emacs uh, more than 10 years ago. I've still used Vim before that, and I still use Vim nowadays for some tasks, but uh, I fell in love with Emacs extensibility, how easy it is to change it. Uh, it does not feel like a text editor to me, not even an IDE. It mostly feels like an operating system, a text-based operating system. Nowadays, I use most of my time inside Emacs. And it's not just for coding, it's also for managing my tasks and goals, for reading my emails, reading news articles, and so on. I even wrote this presentation using Emacs org mode, org mode by exporting it with Lattice Beamer. So, why am I telling you this? For many years, my main issue with Emacs was its configuration file, which is written in eLisp, uh, Emacs dialect for Lisp. Uh, and, um, uh, I really wish that I could configure it using Python, which is my main language. But uh, when I was battling the JSON issues I described in the previous slide, at some point, point it finally clicked. I finally started understanding why do we need the uh, Lisp and all those things. So basically, I had to write configuration files, which is data. But I also needed to contain code. I could have invented a new way to do that, but why bother if Lisp is here? So uh, uh, I started playing with the Lisp in Raider, and slowly I started understanding why do we need all those ugly parentheses in Lisp? They're not for us humans, they're for the machine. Uh, we humans are supposed to ignore them and focus on the code and its indentation. Uh, and uh, it all started to uh, slowly make sense. Um, macro started to make sense, and I couldn't wait out to try it all out in Raider. By now it's clear, I hope, why Lisp, but why Highlang? Well, the most important reason is because it compiles into Python code. You can still access all of your Python libraries, which is super important, especially in the security field, where so many tools and uh, uh, libraries are already written in Python. So Highlang combines the flexibility of Lisp, uh, Lisp with the power of Python. And uh, it's also relatively easy to learn if you know Python. It's basically just uh, Python uh, uh, code written with um, Lisp syntax. Now since we covered the basics, let's go into the details. In my experience, a lot of pen testers see the authentication part of the application as a black box. Uh, they assume uh, this part is safe and uh, they don't try to look at it that much. Which is a shame because it uh, causes uh, many bugs to get overlooked. And with this talk, and the radar in particular, I aim to make it easier for people to understand and test complex HTTP processes like authentication, but not limited to that. So uh, now I'm going to show you some techniques on how to reverse engineer such complex processes, like the authentication. So here you can see a screenshot of uh, Meetum proxy, which is another proxy tool. And I captured all the traffic that's being generated while logging in on Reddit. And as you can see, there are 392 requests here. Most of those are not relevant. So we need to remove everything uh, which is not. Those are mostly JavaScript file, images, uh, videos, and so on. So after we remove all those uh, unnecessary ones, we are left with some, something that is, is much easier to digest. But uh, all, uh, it's still not all of those requests are relevant. We need to figure out how the authentication works, which ones are relevant, which are not, and so on. One way to do this would be to start from the beginning, from the first request, and trace back uh, 
uh, all of the inputs and the outputs being used and generated until the end. However, um, this is not always the most efficient way because you can get sidetracked. Uh, uh, it's very easy to assume that some um, cookie or some header uh, is relevant in the process, while in reality it's not. And uh, sometimes it's easier if you start from the end. So you pick one request which only works if the user is authenticated. It should fail otherwise. And go back from there. So here's how one such request looks like. And uh, here you can see uh, uh, there are several uh, blurred uh, fields uh, in the headers which could all potentially be used to identify the user. Now, we need to figure out which ones of those are important. How do we do that? We remove everything piece by piece until we arrive at the simplest request possible, which still gives us back the authenticated result. And uh, here's what I came up with. Uh, the first two headers, host and user agent, are required by, by the HTTP protocol, so those um, are not uh, relevant here. The three ones highlighted in red are generated automatically by um, uh, right, um, Python request library, so those can also be ignored. So this means we have only one piece of information which identifies us in this request. And this is the authorization bearer token. So for this particular endpoint, we only need this one input to identify us. But how do we get it? Well, we search the traffic for this particular string and identify the first request, which gives us back this token in the response. And here's what I found. Uh, on the left side, you can see the request. On the right side, it's the, the response body. And this access token is hidden somewhere deep inside the response body. And this is the only output that we need from this particular information exchange. But what are the inputs? Here you can see again there's some uh, few blurred fields which can also potentially be used. And we do the same thing again. We remove everything piece by piece until we arrive at the simplest request possible, which still returns us back this uh, access token in the response. That's how you reverse engineer such processes. And uh, the more details to it, uh, I, I'm not going to show you everything until the end for Reddit authentication. I'm just showing you some techniques. But now I need to focus on Raider. So now let's talk about finite state machines. Finite state machines are a mathematic, mathematical model of computation that allows you to analyze complex uh, computer systems. So a system is stateful if it remembers the preceding events. Uh, for example, HTTP protocol, it's stateless. Each HTTP request is independent from the other ones, while the authentication process is stateful because you need to complete every single step of the process in the right order and actually uh, in order to get actually authenticated. This state is the information which you remember about the system. And the system can be in only one of its finite number of states at any given time. And the so-called melee finite state machines can be used best to model the authentication systems. And uh, we can have multiple inputs, multiple outputs, and the output values are determined both by the current state and its inputs. And here's how one such single state would look like. Uh, with its inputs and outputs uh, if we model uh, the authentication process using the um, finite states machine. So in this case, we have uh, three inputs, the username, password, and CSRF token. The server verifies them and returns us back some cookies. To model the entire authentication uh, from the beginning to the end, we need to chain uh, multiple such steps together. And uh, 
Here you can see a simplified uh, diagram of how that would look like uh, with uh, each state having its inputs and outputs hidden because otherwise it would get too complicated to put it here. So basically we start with an, uh, in an unauthenticated state. We open the login web page, we send the credentials, the server checks them. If they're wrong, we go to the login failed state. If they're correct, uh, the multi-factor authentication is checked if it's enabled or not. Uh, if it's uh, disabled, we go straight to authenticated. If it's enabled, we go through one more step. And the server checks the code and sends us back respectively, either failed or passed. That's basically it. That's how you model the authentication system using finite state machines. Now, how do we do this with radar? And the so-called uh, radar flows are basic building blocks in radar. And they are used to describe the information exchange during one single step of the process. So you have one single request, one single response. To create a flow, you just need to give it the URL. And uh, optionally, uh, it also may have some outputs and some operations. The outputs are, uh, in the outputs, you tell uh, radar what information to extract from the response, while the operations either run some arbitrary actions after the receiving the response, or it links to other flows, and it can also be conditional. And depending, uh, let's say we receive a HTTP um, status code 200, we go to flow A, otherwise we go to flow B. Now, uh, here's how two such flows interact with each other in Raider. Uh, basically, each uh, flow uh, needs, to, needs to have one request and one response. Uh, the request may uh, optionally have some inputs, while the response my op might uh, optionally return some outputs. And uh, also, each flow also optionally can have, can have some operations, which uh, I said can uh, either run some arbitrary actions when you receive the response, or uh, tell radar which flow to go to next. Another important part is the outputs from previous flow flows can be used as inputs for the next ones. This is how radar keeps track of the state. That's how you share information between the flows. So basically, to create a flow, you just need to give it one request. And now let's take a look, look at the request. The only required parameter is the URL. Everything else is optional. You specify the uh, um, uh, HTTP method via the class method. Uh, you can also give it some uh, cookies, headers, some parameters to append to the URL, uh, or uh, use HTTP body data either in um, URL encoded format, in JSON, in multipart, and so on. Uh, and each of those can contain plugins. Uh, I'm going to explain plugins in the next slide, but those are used to sh share data between flows. So plugins are small pieces of code. They can be used uh, as inputs and or outputs you can use them to extract data from somewhere. Let's say from the user, from the terminal, or from a file. You can also extract um, some data from uh, the response body, uh, or from uh, uh, JSON, from, um, uh, from the URL query, and so on. You you'll use plugins also to manipulate data, encode it, decode it, do some string manipulations, and so on. Some of those can also be nested and the user can write their own plugins without touching Radar Core. Now operations. And they run after the response is received, as I said, and they can execute arbitrary code. But the most important thing why operations exist is to co control the information flow, to tell Radar where to go to next, and whether this, the uh, HTTP process completed successfully or it failed. Uh, operations can also run other operations conditionally. As I said, uh, it can check for the status code, it can check for response body matching something and so on. 
you can even run real Highline code by using the Lisp code thing. And the users can write own operations without touching the core. Now, let's talk about flow graphs. Uh, there, uh, recent, uh, re recently, it's a really a relatively recent feature introduced in Raider, and they used to chain multiple flows together until the end, and or until success or failure operations return. Basically, they just a pointer uh, to the first flow, but optionally, it can also have the second flow, which just run an additional test to see if the process completed successfully or not. And you can simulate complex system using this uh, architecture. And as you can see in the screenshot, you can have uh, uh, independent flows like uh, flow 9, which only returns success or failure, or you can have uh, complex networks of flows, some with a flow graph pointing to it, and other, uh, others without. Some will return success or failure, others will not. And uh, from uh, Raider command line, you can run either a flow, a flow graph, or any combination of flows and flow graphs as you want. And uh, if uh, you run some uh, flow uh, without having some uh, inputs already, Raider will, will prompt you for those inputs manually. Uh, so you can run from uh, write a command line. Let's say we start from uh, a flow four, then go to flow nine, then run flow graph two until the end, till success, then run flow three, and so on. Any kind of combination of flows and flow graphs is allowed. And this enables uh, us to uh, test uh, very complex scenarios. Now uh, I'm going to show you the demo. So uh, for this demo, I prepared, um, uh, I automated some processes uh, within uh, OWASP Juice Shop, which is an uh, intentionally vulnerable application. For this first example, I automated the registration and the login part. And uh, here you can see approximately how this, that looks like. For the, to actually register a user, we need to send three different requests. So first is to get the security questions, the next one is to register a user, and the last one is to submit the security answer. So we created those uh, three flows and have the register flow graph pointing to the first one. And uh, uh, additionally, we also have the login uh, flow, which uh, needs just one step. And uh, as you can see, some of those um, uh, flows return success and failure, others do not. So now you can see of us juice shop, and uh, I'm just gonna show you that I don't have the user yet. So now it will fail. But yeah, let's take a look at the code first. So here's uh, the project files for this um, uh, for juice shop. And the first one. Uh, and the main file uh, is mostly just creating some um, uh, plugins. So, so basically, uh, the, the first one is just a string. We created the base URL for OWASP Juice, Juice Shop. Then we have here some uh, a plugin which will extract uh, the uh, question from JSON. Uh, here below we have some other JSON plugins. Uh, those uh, three variable plugins, uh, email, password, and dasher will be uh, the information we created uh, about the user uh, here below. And uh, we have two more plugins. One is a cookie, which is created from uh, a previously defined auth token plugin, and it will be named token. And the last plugin is a regular expression, which will just uh, match some HTML code and print it to um, uh, you'll see later. It's for another attack. So basically here I created the plugins. Now let's see the registration. Uh, so here we have uh, in total three flows. And the first one uh, is uh, we'll get the security question. And uh, I'm using uh, with base URL here. It's a macro, just uh, appends the base URL we defined to this one. And it will uh, extract the question. It will print it and go to the next stage. 
Now for the next flow, we send a POST request with the JSON body and all the credentials here inside. It will extract the user ID and uh, then it will uh, check for regular expression in the response body to see if the email is already registered or not. So um, if we try to register twice with the same email, it will fail and it will print this. Otherwise, it will print the whole body and go to the last um, flow. Uh, so here we send a POST request uh, with the JSON body and uh, it's very similar except uh, it will check for HTTP status 201, uh, which means the user was created, otherwise it will return failure. And here at the end we have the flow graph which points to the very first flow here. Uh, now let's look at the login on. This is simpler. So basically we have just a POST request with the email and password and it will output the auth token. Then it will uh, check if um, and the status code was 401, uh, uh, which means uh, the log login failed. Otherwise it will print it uh, yeah, and return success. Now uh, here is uh, uh, how this configuration looks like in uh, Raider. Basically, you can see uh, just show the project. Here you can see the file names. So for each file name, you can see all the uh, flows and the flow graphs are in red and that are configured in this file. So by default, we also get the default flow graph, which is just uh, to run the very first uh, flow. It's just for convenience purposes. Uh, but now let's run it. So, I want to register, then log in. And as you can see, it, uh, uh, it got the security questions and printed them, registered the user, uh, printed the response body, submitted the security answer, and created the user successfully. Then it ran the flow login, which printed uh, the uh, token for us, the auth token. If we try to run it again, it will fail because we cannot register a user with the same email twice. Now if we go back here, then we already logged in and it works. So, so that was it for the first uh, demo. Now the second demo will actually exploit uh, an SQL injection in JuiceRob. Uh, when you log in JuiceRob, the email input field is vulnerable to SQL injection. And uh, we are uh, testing this with the radar, like you can see here. There is just uh, one single uh, flow which points to itself, and there is a flow graph pointing to it. So now let's take a look at the code to see what exactly that looks like for SQL injection. So that's it. We have uh, this login SQLI flow, which will send a POST request uh, and uh, with a JSON body, but here you can see that instead of sending some string for the email, it will prompt us the user for the payload. And this is how we're going to test it. So it will also output the out token, print uh, the response body, and check for status code. If status code is 200, that means we logged in successfully. Otherwise, it will go to itself. So it will run in a loop otherwise. Now let's see how this looks like. SQLI test. Yeah, so if we just input some random value, it will give us back invalid email or password, which is as expected. But if, if we include a single code, we will see that there is some error, some um, SQL error. And uh, I'm not going to explain you how uh, all of this works. I'm just going to use the solution for now. And we can see uh, the login process completely successfully. We got the token and we authenticated as the admin user. Now for the last example. This one is a little bit more complicated because uh, you need uh, to chain multiple things together. The ultimate goal here is to exploit uh, a stored cross-site scripting issue, which uh, can be found 
uh, in the change username uh, uh, flow uh, here. Basically, when you change the username, you can uh, use some uh, XSS attacks inside this field. But you cannot exploit it because of the so-called content security policy header uh, configured here. But this can, this can also be bypassed with another vulnerability in JuiceRob, which is why we have the second CSP test thing. And um, I'm going to show you all of this into the details very soon, but uh, uh, first, to actually run those, we need the auth token. So we can get them either by using uh, the regular login or the SQLite test. Uh, both of them return the auth token, as you already saw. So now let's look at the code. Here's for the XSS. And so basically we have uh, two flows here and the one flow graph. And the flow graph points to the first flow. So basically the first one will just query the user profile and print the um, part of the HTML code which uh, we are interested in. And uh, the second one will uh, submit a POST request with a username, changing the uh, username. And uh, it will also uh, use the prompt thing to ask us in the terminal line which username we want to have. And uh, yeah, and uh, it will run in a loop. So from the first request, uh, it will go unconditionally to the second one. And from the second one, it will go unconditionally to the first one. It will just run two flows in a loop infinitely. Now for the content security policy one, uh, we have also two flows and one flow graph pointing to the first one, but here's a little bit different. Uh, so basically we, re we request the profile page, we print the content security policy header here, and we check if we, the user is satisfied with the result. If the answer is yes, uh, the process returns success. Otherwise, it goes to the next flow to change picture URL. And here it will just submit th uh, this thing with uh, what we told it in the prompt right here. And, um, and for a reason you'll understand very soon, we need to wait for the server to time out uh, uh, 30 seconds. So to do this, I just use the Lisp code to run uh, to import the time uh, uh, library from Python and sleep for 30 seconds. Then I go to the, uh, um, back to the first flow. So this will run also in a loop. Now let's look at how this actually looks in practice. So the first step could be either, either login or SQLI test, which I've showed before also gets us back this uh, token. But since I don't want to, uh, uh, do the SQL injection attack again. I'm just going to use login. It's faster. The second one was CSP test and cross site scripting test. And I guess that's going to work. Let's see. Yeah, so first uh, it printed the existing content security policy header. And uh, this doesn't work for us because we need one more attribute here. Uh, we need uh, unsafe uh, inline. Uh, we, we need to add new attribute. So I'm not satisfied with the result. And uh, oops, sorry, I need to repeat that. Yeah, so now it asks for the image URL, which will uh, upload, uh, which will change the user avatar. Just give me a second. I'm going to do something. So uh, now we give uh, the server uh, an invalid URL, but at the end we have appended the actual uh, attributes that we want. And uh, uh, the server will try to get this URL, which is why we need to wait for it to time out. And now in a few seconds it will time out, and you, you will see that despite the invalid URL, we will still get the content security policy header updated. 
here. So it changed to what we wanted. So now hopefully it will work. And I'm satisfied with the result. Uh, now let's take a look at the cross-site scripting thing. So basically right now you won't see anything interesting, but if I use test username, you will see my string here. So basically this field is vulnerable to cross-site scripting. And uh, we can try the regular alert. And you will see that it gets filtered. So uh, we need to bypass this filter as well. And uh, I'm just going to use the solution since I don't have time to explain it all here. Uh, I'm going to print documented cookie. And I guess that works. And if you go to the profile page, you should see the cookies in the alert box. I hope. <laughs> Why is it so slow? I don't know what's going on. Ah, yes. So here it is. And, uh, oh, yeah, that's basically it. That's all for the demo part. Hope you like it. So, uh, what's next? Basically, right now, uh, the documentation part of Radar is incomplete. Uh, there are still many changes which have been done, but has not been um, uh, actually reflected into the documentation. After that, I need to focus on the way users interact with the Radar. So, um, basically, right now, the debugging features are still missing. And it's also a very limited command line interface. Um, and uh, I think one great addition would be to have a REPL, so a read eval print loop. Basically, instead of running, um, instead of uh, changing the source code and running a uh, reader from the command line, you could do all of this in real time. Another interesting thing uh, that I've experimented with uh, was uh, using uh, uh, GPT-4 to actually generate high files from a natural language. Um, Basically, it almost worked. It was like 80% correct, but there's some errors which um, and does not allow it to run. And if uh, anyone knows how uh, to train it and is willing to help me with the uh, large language models, I will accept my, uh, your help. And uh, I'm also interested in adding some new features. So basically, the fuzzing part uh, uh, was um, kind of working at the beginning, but now with a lot of uh, architectural changes, it broke completely. So I need a properly functioning fuzzing mechanism here. I also want to, to have a rather keep track of the sessions so that you can recall or reuse previously um, uh, seen inputs and or outputs. I also want to uh, implement more macros to make it uh, simpler to actually write the configuration files. And last but not least, I'm also interested in integrating Radar with other tools, which will benefit from having something like this. Now, I admit, uh, Radar has some big limitations. It has uh, a relatively steep learning curve. Uh, it already assumes that uh, people uh, already know uh, finite state machines and are comfortable using uh, Lisp Python coding. And, uh, and with Lisp, it's a thing that many people are just scared of those uh, Lisp parentheses everywhere. So uh, I, I hope it won't be a big issue. But uh, there is also a very limited community support. Radar is still a recent to a tool. There are not so many people using it yet. And uh, it's also the... Um, uh, I'm only working and testing it on Linux. I don't know about... Um, uh, uh, the compatibility with other operating systems. I haven't tested it. So, 
Now to end the presentation, I want to say that radar is not just a toy anymore. It can be used for complex real-life systems. I've already used it for a lot of stuff uh, during my job for penetration testing. But there's still a lot of uh, work to do and room for improvement. And if, uh, if you are interested in uh, uh, helping or learning more about it, uh, feel free to uh, look into those links and contact me. And now I'm open for the questions. No questions? I can't hear anything. <laughs> Hi. You said earlier that you were interested in uh, I mean, not so much earlier as you said you were interested in integrating with other tools. Do yeah. you mean like integrating with Zap and adding the radar as an optional uh, authentication provider, or would this not be an option? Uh, can you repeat, please? I didn't get it, the last part. Um, if it would be possible to write a plugin for Zap to use radar as the authentication method, so that yeah, radar yeah. does the authentication, and then Zap does the scanning. Uh, yeah, uh, we are already in talks with the Zap developers about this, but uh, we still haven't made uh, any progress yet, so it's still in, in planning. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> That's it, I guess. Okay, thank you very much.